Hi, Paul Thompson here from Spitfire Audio. Today we're going to focus on using choir and choral textures in your scores, particularly alongside orchestral instrumentation. I've got examples from across four different genres where I'm going to show you how using the choir can really bring your scores to life. And I'm going to be using the Originals Epic Choir, Eric Whittaker Choir, and our latest choral venture, Eric Whittaker Contrast, alongside Spitfire Libraries, everything from Abbey Road to Albion to Appassionata. Let's dive straight in. We're going to start off with action music. This sound of the kind of full-throated, maybe 50 to 100 piece choir is very familiar from films like Jerry Goldsmith's The Omen or uh, Hans Zimmer's Crimson Tide. Um, it's a sound that you'll very, be very familiar with. And one of the kind of very common tropes in action music is to use the uh, staccato with different kind of syllables. Sometimes it's a kind of fake Latin. Um, but one of the really useful patches that we have here in the Originals Epic Choir is this short staccato syllables. Here I'm using just the tenors and basses, and then I'll add the uh, sopranos and altos in the next example. But this is a kind of beat down. I'll play it down first, and then I'll give you a couple of tips on what I'm doing in this example. Okay, what's worth noting here? I've got a kind of pedal, pretty much, so that everything is kind of motoring around the same kind of chord, same key. And what I'm doing is I'm building up the choir. The choir is kind of moving up the scale, dropping back down, moving up. It's that kind of building tension like that. I'm using 7-8, which is a uh, moderately irregular time signature, um, in the sense that it's not just a straight 4-4-3-4 four, four, four or something like that. Um, there's two reasons for this. One is that every bar, it throws your brain off slightly as the listener. So it keeps you on the edge of your seat. Um, and the other really useful thing is when you're writing, uh, if you're writing just a piece of music and you want to kind of make it more interesting, you can throw in a few bars of uh, different time sig signatures here and there. So you might throw in a 2-4 bar into 7-8 works really well. Um, sometimes a 3-4 or a 5-4 bar. Um, and then you, you're kind of constantly changing the goalposts, as it were. The other really useful thing is if you're writing to picture, being able to then throw in some of those bars here and there to make sure that you hit a cut is incredibly useful and most people don't notice as you're going along. So that's the, uh, that's the first example. What are we using in here just to give you a quick lowdown on stuff that you can hear? Um, some very straightforward stuff. So we've got the, uh, the brass, low brass, Stack Artissimos from Abbey Road 1. Um, I'm using some ensemble strings. Uh, again, really easy and quick and, you know, straightforward to, to use, to write with the, the old ensembles here. Um, I've got a bit of Neo in here. This is just uh, adding, I'll just highlight that. Yeah, you can see uh, just that part on its own, actually. And then on the percussion front, um, I've mixed up a couple of the rhythms. So if you just have a listen to the Hans Zimmer Tycho's on their own. So I'm using a kind of double hit on the beginning of every other bar. And the way that that locks in with the other percussion is quite interesting. So the, the Darbuka is playing a very much more straightforward pattern. Um, and that is doing a little bit of a turnaround halfway through. And then we've got a, a very regular uh, bit here. So all of those things together give you that kind of feel of a rolling rhythm. That's the idea of it. And then here, just very quickly, we've got uh, some very straightforward timpani on the beginning of every bar. Really straightforward, then that's adding to the pedal feel. Um, a pedal, just to explain if anyone's not familiar with that term, a pedal can either be a low uh, continuous note, so it's it's holding that note or even pulsing that note like I'm doing here while you move the chords or the parts around it, but it gives you that constant thing. Pedal can also be up at the top. You can imagine that typical high string, while well, strange chords move underneath it. That's a really good example of that. 
can be in the middle as well and you can have things moving around it but the idea of a pedal is it gives you one constant frame of reference one constant pitch and then the harp part is you know pretty straightforward as well so the harp is kind of coming and going um, it's really just a little bit of colour in the background. It's not doing anything of any kind of real significance, but it's adding to that kind of pedal feel as well. We've got a singular tubular bell at the beginning of every uh, other bar. Uh, again, pedal uh, on there. And then we've got another kind of percussive element here on the final build up. So you can see what the xylophone is doing there. It's just kind of accenting some of the beats. And you'll also see that, you know, I haven't got quantize on this. I kind of mix it up. I sometimes put uh, quantize on, um, especially for things like the string parts where I want it to be very kind of precise. I'll always drop the strength a little bit and move and maybe kind of move the delay back a little bit here, um, 40 ticks or something like that, because all of those string notes start with the sound of the bow starting the string moving. It's almost like a kind of triangle at the front of the note. So you always have to allow for that. But that's um, that's the first piece, and that's a, a, a look at the, uh, at the overall orchestration there. Now, what about our second piece? Let's move this forward. And if I highlight both of these parts, let's just close this down for a second. Um, and then if you look at those, you can see that there is a, definite pattern to this as well and you can see that it's gradually going up the scale now I'll show you the score for that so for the sopranos and altos we're in D this time and you can see for the tenors and basses a bit thicker putting some kind of crazy big chords in there to give it a really epic kind of sound and as before we're using the random kind of uh, staccato syllables you can always uh, use a, a key switch for those so that you get the exact one that you want at the exact moment um, but if I move that forward you can see that there's kind of similar orchestration around this we've got all the same kind of things I'm using the solo strings this time to give it a different texture always great to have solo strings in action music I find because they're very very spiky and aggressive and they work really really well now you'll notice that we've got 4-4 four, four now and the tempo is slower so if I just go into the section 72 BPM. This is a different kind of style. This is more along that kind of like um, uh, the feeling that that it's inevitability is the thing that I'm going for on this. So have a quick listen. This section here, uh, just to show something that's a little bit interesting. When you're doing these kind of um, these kind of action sequences, are often post-produced um, to get this super super tight kind of sound. There's often a, an element of post-production on there where smaller sections are recorded and then are kind of chopped up and lined up in Pro Tools to get them absolutely rigid. Um, now to simulate that effect, I've just recorded this part that you can see here. And if I click to the piano roll, you'll see how that looks. And I have used the time machine patch from Albion One, the legacy folder. Don't miss the legacy folder, some great stuff in there. That's, that's from the original Albion legacy library. And I've got this uh, high string Austin Artem Spiccato. And I've gone in for the tightness a little bit over here and I've used the uh, time stretch to compress the sound of this. So it's happening in a shorter time than would be kind of normal um, with that size section. So that produces this quite interesting sound. So the next genre that I wanna look at is one that I call story progression. Um, what do I mean by this? This is using the choir as really um, a part of the orchestra and part of a kind of storytelling mode rather than really calling attention to itself. 
Um, and I've got two examples that I'm going to play for you. But general examples are in things like Save Him Private Ryan, John Williams, Hymn to the Fallen has some really great choral writing where the choir is kind of weaving in and out of the orchestra. So that's what I've done on this first example. So let's have a quick listen to this first and then we'll talk about what I'm doing in there. So what am I doing here? Well, you can see, I'll just zoom that in a little bit. You can see that each of these choir parts has, I'm just using the, um, the U legato patch from each of the uh, sections, and I've given them their own part of the overall tune. What else is going on in here? So you'll see I've got uh, various different sections. If we just solo what we might call the brass choir first, uh, you can see what's going on here. So you get the idea. It's very much that kind of pastoral stuff. Um, in the strings, I'm using all appassionata. Uh, and if we just highlight all of those so you can see what's going on there. Very, very straightforward again. Nice and bucolic, a little bit of percussion, just the harp noodling around. And then of course we've got the choir. So the choir is sounding like this. The two things I would take from this, one is that the, I'm simply using the choir as part of the orchestra. They're, they're just like another instrument. Each section of the choir is just like a different instrument within its range, and it's adding to the overall harmonic feel of the music. The one thing that I am doing differently is I'm putting more uh, suspensions into the choir parts than I am currently doing in the other parts. And the thing that I really love about that is you get the tension of... It gives you something really emotional because you've got the feel of the human voice and you've got those kind of temporary clashes that are happening against the chords as they're moving in the background. So that's something that I really do enjoy with the voice is, is leaving those, um, you know, sometimes it's simply a, a, a way of leaving a note to hang on into the next chord or bringing a note in early or moving through a non-chord note. But all of those things that give you a kind of nice suspension um, it with second ninths or seconds especially or fourths or elevenths as they're called uh, as well um, any of those kind of passing tones really really helps that kind of feel now let's look at our second example and you'll see that here I'm just using a simple hum evo and the idea of this is that you've got a kind of low tone something that's kind of mysterious um, and I'm using the choir instead of the string section playing those chords. So I'm on the bottom end, if I look at these two parts here, I've got the Hans Zimmer strings up, I'm using uh, a simple low pedal note on the basses and I'm doing a little bit of modulation here and expression just to kind of add a bit of interest to that note. It's always worth putting a bit of variation within so it's not just one constant long thing. And then here I've, I'm using this incredibly useful and again modulation and expression being varied incredibly useful kind of effect patch with these uh, 20 cellos where they are taking it in turns to do a little bit of trim and it's consored or muted uh, and also a little bit close to the bridge or sol pont, um, ponticello being the Italian for bridge I believe uh, and that basically makes it a little bit edgy as well um, but it's a sound that's got some movement in it so I'm picking my 
my pedal notes, my things that are just holding constant, but I'm trying to use things that do have a bit of life in them as well so they don't just sound boring. There's a kind of pulsing timpani going along as well, as you can see there, and uh, that's it. And then we've got the hum. That part wouldn't be, you know, out of place played on any other section of the orchestra. It could be in the strings, it could be in the brass, the woodwinds. Um, but here, using the voice, and especially this kind of very closed sound, gives you something really interesting. And uh, the voice always brings an extra degree of humanity to what you're writing. So we're in D minor. So the pedal note is D on the basses and the cellos down there. And then uh, we start with this chord, which is a D minor chord. And then we move to this chord and we could imagine uh, that B there spelt uh, in a slightly different way. If you spell it as, an, as a C flat, it's the same note as B natural, then we have a C flat, an E flat and an A flat, which is A flat minor. And where is A flat? It's the tritone away from D. So that always produces a really nice... Um, Transition that makes you think of, uh, you know, film mystery is going from a minor chord to the minor chord up a tritone. So that's quite a useful little thing. Then we do the same thing again. So we go from the D minor and it's up uh, here, starting on D instead of starting on the A there. Um, so we've moved up slightly in pitch and then we just go up a semitone with the bass notes and we've got the same chord. It's still that A flat minor. There's the there's the B that we can also call C flat. So A flat, C flat, E flat. And then finally up here, uh, we've got that F sharp could be thought of as a G flat, then a B flat, then an E flat coming down to the D. And that semitone movement is quite nice, uh, going either going away from or coming back to the root, the kind of pedal. Um, so that's the harmonic language of that example. Let's move on to the next section, which is uh, what I've called beauty and magic. There are many, many examples of this, but probably the most famous example of all time is that legendary piece of music by Danny Elfman uh, for Edward Scissorhands. Now, I'm not doing an Edward Scissorhands, but let's listen to my first example, which does use the sopranos uh, singing ooh and then various other bell-like happenings around it. Have a listen. Okay, it's very, very simple, um, but you can hear that uh, that lovely kind of legato ooh there. I've got a bunch of reverb on it, and I would probably even make it breathier and, and more reverberant. In fact, as we're here, why don't I do that? And let's have a listen. So if I really like almost double the time of the reverb there, and I could just use the stock logic plugin, which is, um, which is absolutely lovely, absolutely fine. I'm going to take a bit of the low end, take a bit of that mid range where the uh, where the kind of fundamentals of the voice happen. And if I push these up a bit so we can. So we're really, we could even go nuts on that. Let's look at the uh, reverb again and we could use we could use all reverb because we've got a load of early reflections in the sound. This was recorded in Air Lindhurst, so it's got a ton of that stuff. Um, and actually, we could um, when we're looking at the reverb, we could pull back up, make sure we're not kind of cutting too much of that, make it a little bit wobblier. Uh, and oh yes, here we go. Put a big old pre delay on, and that would sound like this. It 
try and picture what the sound that you're hearing in your head would look like if you saw it as a picture. And here I'm seeing um, that kind of almost Lord of the Rings, that kind of bright, hazy beauty, uh, trying to kind of affect that kind of sound. And actually, just to show you what I'm using there in the in terms of the uh, other sounds, we open with um, that wonderful cymbalom sprangle. If we have a look at that on the piano roll, you can see what I'm doing. I'm, it's both hands, but I'm kind of I'm using a, uh, you know, a nice kind of spread there. A couple of other harp like and celeste like, you know, uh, uh, sounds in here, plus the organ is playing something. And here's a good example of what I was talking about earlier, a pedal note, which is uh, this one here. Uh, and that is playing all the way along. So that gives you your kind of suspended feel around the whole thing. And then a couple of other sounds that are just kind of adding little touches on there. And finally, we've got a pizzicato part just for a bit of fun to add a, a little bit of extra. It's super, super loose, as you can see, and it's not really doing anything of any massive significance if I... Interesting to show you the the kind of key center I'm using. Um, which is the C Dorian scale. So you've got that kind of flattened third and flattened seventh. Um, and I guess it's always difficult to say modal because modal can mean all kinds of different things and every scale is just a mode. But what it does give you, it's not a straightforward minor scale or, you know, it's giving you something that's slightly altered from the thing that you're used to hearing, which is really, really useful as well, because that also helps give you a kind of slightly otherworldly kind of feel. So uh, let's move on to the next example. Okay, so I'm blending two sounds from the Eric Whitaker library. So the first one is uh, this Evo Grid sound from the Eric Whitaker choir. And here I just, I did highlight there as I played through, you can see those four different articulations I'm using. And I've been careful so that I've got one of them being triggered. Uh, across a different cell for each note of the chord. And then on the uh, contrast library, I'm using just a very light chattery sort of sound. It's just got the occasional chattasa, so that kind of thing, which gives you some interest in there. Um, I'm doing the same kind of EQ uh, thing that I was doing before, actually, on both of these sounds, which is to make them both very, very breathy. Uh, and I can play those together. Now the chord that I'm playing here, which is not totally being represented correctly in this score <laughs> part there, um, but the chord that I'm playing here, just so you can see it properly, is uh, F sharp at the top, C sharp, A, and G sharp. So I'm using that second or ninth, uh, depending on how you prefer to think of it. And then on here, with the different parts that I'm using uh, at the bottom, let's just look at the UI here. So the bottom note is an F sharp, and the the uh, part that I'm using there is a major second, so that's playing that G sharp as well. So that's the second or the ninth. Here um, on the A, we're using a uh, major third, which gives us the A and the C sharp. So that's the third and the fifth of that F sharp minor chord. And then here on a C, if I just expand that up, you can see. And the reason for that if I hold that C down. To get that fabulous clash, um, I'm using that because I want that sharp four in the chord. So if I just go to, uh, to our string sound up here, which is super simple, it's just uh, Abbey Road high string trem. Um, the chord, actually, I'll show you the chord that I'm playing here. 
The chord is simply that F sharp minor chord. But the effect of having all of these clashes in means that the scale that I'm actually using is this one. And it doesn't really matter what the other notes would be in between, but it gives you, if I hold those all down, just pull that down a bit, it sounds like this. Which is a really lovely chord, but what I'm trying to do here is not to be just really obvious about it and play all those notes on the strings. I'm trying to have parts that are moving um, between notes, so where you have those pitch clash um, elements of the Eric Whittaker library, the choir, part of the choir is moving between the two notes and that gives you some movement within the chord but it also introduces some of those clashes as moving parts which really makes a massive difference. Um, and if you're doing it just orchestrally you can mimic that, you know, for example you might get uh, the a flute up, uh, let's pop a flute up and you could play, you know, even something like this. in amongst that chord. In fact, let's do it and see what happens. So finally, um, we're going to add in some contrast. I'm going to use the um, scale mode for this. It's incredibly easy to either set a scale here or to just simply select the notes that you want to be able to sound. I'm using scale mode here. Um, and that means that as I play, if I play uh, at different velocities, I will get different results coming out, but it's always repeatable. So whatever you've recorded in will always play back the same way. Now, I've treated the choir from this contrast library in exactly the same way. I've got the same EQ on as our breathy sound. Just have a quick listen to that. Now, as you can see, I'm using a out of scale note here, just kind of plonked it in just to see what happens. And because it's not set to trigger, it doesn't affect anything. So you can kind of just play around. And as long as you've got your scale mode set correctly, everything will make sure that what you're hearing works with the tonality or scale of the part that you're writing. So you can see what I'm getting at. It's um, it's all about just really introducing elements of uh, life and humanity and things that are just a little bit unusual into your music. That's a really great way to make your music sound more interesting and take what you've got and really make the most of it. Now, the next section that I want to talk to you about is the kind of horror uh, slash thriller um, type of, of thing. And I've got two quick examples from that. One is an impact hit where we use uh, the choir as part of that impact. And the thing that I like to do on these things is to use any kind of sound that's um, where you can just kind of plonk down a big chord and have lots of unusual stuff happening. So that's what this uh, feeling lucky is for. I've randomized a few times, played a couple of big chords and then found a, a sound that I liked. And I've used that in this little example. And it sounds like this. So really the name of the game here is to go for a very kind of clashing sound um, with lots and lots of dissonance, lots of, um, you know, semitones rubbing against each other and all of that kind of stuff. But I've spread it across quite a wide range. And then everything else uh, that's going on at the beginning is just all of the very, very straightforward stuff. It's, uh, you know, we've got the basses doing a, a colenio part down the bottom here. It's, it's very straightforward, sounds like this. Ah, I did do something else on there. So this, I'm taking inspiration from Alien. Um, and one of the things that I loved about the Alien score, the original score, was the use of the Echoplex. And so I've got a kind of old-fashioned sounding uh delay here echo and i've set it so that you get that really kind of uh, cool retro sound 
beyond that, if you haven't investigated this section of the Albion Library, you must investigate it. And that is these two little uh, legacy parts here, the effects sections from the first Albion Legacy. Now, these are derived from charts that I wrote many, many years ago for the original Bespoke Library, the very first thing that Spitfire recorded. And I just kind of, it was stuff that I could grab in 10 or 15 minutes at the end of every session. But there is a wealth of crazy stuff in here. And what I'm using here is this sound. So what's going on in there? Well, it's a, it's, you know, a hard hit at the beginning and then a slide up. But what I'm doing is all of these effects are designed to be playable. So, so if you start low, on the mod wheel, they start quiet, or you can start loud. So all of these things like this one, very, very playable, really cool stuff in there. So make sure you check that out if you've got that, uh, that library. And then, you know, it's the usual thing, <laughs> the low booms. In fact, you can see from the red dots that I've shift selected here to combine these sounds and then I can play them both from one key. And that's a really lovely combi sound. The only other thing we've got going on in there is a little bit of ratchet happening to give you that kind of snaky feel and then just the usual anvil which is the old favorite of any kind of horror or action score. Now We've got one final example, and I will play you that first, and then we'll talk about it. Okay, so before we look at the choir, I'll just show you, I've used uh, exactly what I was just using, but the high version there, the, um, the, le the old legacy effects, and one of those kind of chattery sounds. And then the fun bit, What's going on in this choir section? Well, we're, we're looking at the uh, Eric Whittaker Choir Library and in the individual sections, you'll find some fun bits and bobs. If you've never gone beyond the tutti sections, you really should dig in. And there's these uh, couple of really great effects patches here in the bases. And this one has some great stuff. So what I've done is I've used this, uh, there's a couple of great sounds in here. That's the one that I'm using, but there's also mouth noises and all kinds of crazy stuff in there. So some really good bits and bobs. And I just wanted to, there's nothing like hearing the sound of a group of people whispering something you can't quite understand what it is. That's always a, a great kind of horror suspense kind of thing as well. So super simple there. And then it's about just combining those two sounds in an interesting way. So you get something from the, the strings is the kind of pitches moving around and that kind of, uh, I call them all chatter, but it's that kind of, you know, tremmy sort of sound with lots of, with everyone moving their pitch around and a, a kind of cluster that is bubbling with energy. And then here you've got the whispers of all the kind of voices that are coming through the walls at you if you um, love horror films, which actually I don't. I'm now, for some reason, as I've got older, I've become terribly frightened of horror films, uh, whereas I used to love them, but um, I can't watch them anymore. <laughs> but I watched enough to know all of the great musical tropes that exist in that in that uh, in that stuff. So there we go. So that's four different kind of genre examples, a couple of examples from each one uh, to give you some ideas for things that you can use the choir for in your scoring. I hope that was useful and I look forward to seeing you on the next one. Thank you very much for watching. Bye bye.